All right. Let us do some problems now with torque. So we had defined Newton's second law um, in terms of the net torque on an object last time. We had ended the lecture saying that we can establish that the torque plays the role of force. And we can say something like Newton's second law, but that the net torque equals the rotational inertia times the angular acceleration. And we have Newton's second law, but written in terms of angles and torques instead. And the only additional complication, which it's not really additional because for Newton's second law, everything had to be drawn um, and measured with regard to some coordinate system. You had to put a coordinate system down to measure everything. Similarly, with rotation and torque, the coordinate system in this case really is that you have to specify where your axis of rotation is. And sometimes it will be, and you are free to choose what you want that to be and measure torques and accelerations about. So sometimes it will be obvious, you know, if I'm rotating a screw, I might choose this to be my axis of rotation because that's what clearly the motion is rotating around. But I could have very well, you know, tried to have measured a screw, but said, I'm going to make my axis of rotation right here. And then as I rotate things around, I can measure that rotation from this particular axis of rotation where my finger is. I'm not sure why you would do that, but there, you're free to choose what you're measuring from. By establishing the axis of rotation, you are free to choose what you are measuring torques, angular velocities, angular accelerations from. Again, more often than not, the problem will make it obvious what's the clear choice to make, but it's nonetheless yours to make. The only thing I'll say uh, before we get started is that there is a coordinate convention. Uh, again, like linear systems, you are free to make positive whichever direction you want. Um, but once you start getting into multi-dimensions and three dimensions, it's nice just to have a convention that everyone uses and we don't have to worry about it. You know, you are all very used to the typical convention for linear motion. To the right is positive, to the up is, and up is positive. And most of you have been using that as your convention. And that is typically the agreed upon convention. convention. For rotation, the convention is taking that counterclockwise rotation is positive and then clockwise rotation is negative. Similar to how like when you drew, drew angles in a math class, like usually you measure in the counterclockwise direction, that was a positive angle. Similarly, you know, for torque, we take the similar convention. All right, but let us review with some problems, some rapid fire problems. A wrench is used on a screw as drawn, a force is applied as shown. There's an arrow right here. The torque of the wrench points into out of the page along the wrench along the screw. Then what direction does the resulting angular acceleration point? So going back to what we did last time, we talked about how we can define torque as the cross product, not the dot product, the cross product of the moment arm or a vector pointing from the axis of rotation to where the force is being applied and the applied force. So again, by the right hand rule, the convention was you take your right hand fingers, point your fingers initially along the direction of R and then curl your fingers to point in the direction of F. If you can do that without having to break your wrist, your thumb then points in the direction of the torque. If you can't do it without breaking your wrist, then you usually have to flip your arm around to the other side, and then you can do it. And then your thumb gives you the direction of the torque vector. So in this case, I would see that I'm pointing my fingers kind of along the wrench, that's the, or I guess from the screw to the point where the force is being applied. So you can imagine my hand kind of going out from the screw along the wrench and then they curl downward to point, so my fingers are pointing downwards, curling downwards to point in the direction of the gravitational force. When I do that, I can't, you know, given the way it's drawn on the screen, I can't do that unless my thumb is pointing into the page or into the screen. 
And so as a result, by the second law of motion for rotation, the resulting angular acceleration will then also point into the page. Again, by Newton's law, that the resulting net torque gives me a net, or gives me a resulting angular acceleration. So the angular acceleration will also point into the page. That means, given enough time, an angular velocity will be created that also points into the page. Same rules of vectors, you know, the angular velocity wants to point in the same direction as the angular acceleration given enough time. Just like what we saw for velocity and regular acceleration. So eventually the angular velocity points into the page, and that corresponds to, again, if I use the right-hand rule, my thumb points along the angular velocity, my fingers then curl in the direction that, indeed, the wrench is going to turn. In this case, it looks like it will turn clockwise. The cross product of a vector with itself is... So recall the dot, the, not the dot product, the cross product was defined as geometrically, it is the magnitude of both vectors multiplied by the sine of the angle between them. If it's the same vector, then this angle is zero. The sine of zero is zero, this entire thing is zero. Geometrically, of course, recall when we wrote down something like torque is R cross F, that the magnitude we said could be interpreted as, you know, by definition, this is the definition, but geometrically we can interpret that as the magnet, as the moment arm multiplied by the magnitude of the force that's perpendicular to the moment arm. Obviously when you're thinking about the same vector, there is no component that is perpendicular to itself. So therefore it makes sense that it's zero. A cycle accelerates forward or out of the page. The motor must then be applying a torque on the wheels that points it's left on the page, right on the page, into the page, out of the page. So if the motorcycle is accelerating, that means it's going forward at a faster rate. If we look at this from the point of view of the side, that means that the wheel is going to accelerate forward in some direction. As a result, it has to start rotating faster and faster and faster. Uh, so omega must increase. Um, you know, from some angular acceleration, which then means there is a torque that is being applied if the acceleration um, is non-zero. So we could ask ourselves, looking at this side view of the wheel, where the wheel is rotating in this direction, if the wheel is rotating clockwise as it's drawn on the screen, does omega point into the page or out of the page? So by the right-hand rule, if I want to curl my fingers so that it is clockwise, that results in omega pointing into the page. Therefore, if omega is increasing, that means alpha is also into the page. Because again, when they're parallel, then the velocity gets bigger. When they're anti-parallel, the velocity slows down and then maybe eventually turns around. So then we have to do a little a spatial reasoning here. So if the wheel is rotating uh, such that the motorcycle is coming towards us, that seems like it would be kind of curling, you know, my it's curling towards me, to in which case I would say omega points to the right. So then alpha must point to the right. And if that is the result of a torque, the torque must be pointing to the right on the wheel. And this is where it can definitely get a little trickier to envision. 
Because what I'm saying here is that if there's a wheel, uh, here's the wheel, here's my treads and whatnot, and it is rotating such that that, what kind of looks like a baguette, but that wheel is rotating so that's coming towards you out of the screen, in order for it to spin faster and faster and faster, the torque is pointing to the right. Now again, that doesn't mean there's a force pushing it to the right. Torque is not force. If there was a force pushing the wheel to the right, then the wheel would start to turn, I would imagine. And you know, as, as in the motorcycle, it would start to change directions. But again, we have to remember torque, angular velocity, angular acceleration, the direction the arrow points is not, it's representative of the rotation that is occurring, not because of any, it's not saying the direct direction of say, a force that's being applied. So in this case, to make the wheel rotate faster towards the screen, again, so that the angular velocity is kind of curling more towards me, that results in a torque that must point to the right. I'm going quickly through these, um, I guess I should set up front. Right, definitely, hopefully you are pausing, thinking, and then hearing my answer. I want to do as many examples as possible. A cyclist is stationary and tilts the bike to the left. Describe the resulting fall using torque. Right, so in this case, we could think that you have some person that is, you know, on their bike and they lean to the left. I think it's clear that if we were to do that, you would fall over. And why? Because there is a gravitational force that is pulling down on you. Um, again, if we treat you as the system, ignore the mass of the bike, just treat you as the system, we can think of the gravitational force acting as if you were all located at a, as a particle at your center of mass. And this holds true for torques as well. Uh, I was going to do this example later um, where I state this, but let me just state it now. Um, gravity can definitely torque systems. Um, with a magnitude as if all the mass were located at the center of mass. And again, this is just kind of the rotational extension of an object's kind of overall motion depends on, you know, you can think of everything kind of concentrated at the center of mass, then any external forces are, you know, you can treat them as if they're acting on a particle located at the center of mass. Same idea with gravity, and you can, actually, and you can prove this as well, because you can think gravity is pulling down on different parts of your body but in this case, the rotation axis, or the axis of rotation, might be something like right here. So the bike person is rotating about that point as they fall over. Um, so gravity is pulling down at your feet, and there's a different moment arm from the axis of rotation to your feet compared to the axis, compared to the axis of rotation to your head, and then gravity is pulling down on your head. And again, you can go through the same sort of analysis as how you derive center of mass. And you can show that um, for uniform gravitational fields, you can just imagine everything concentrated at your center of mass and the force of gravity is pulling down there. So in this case, the moment arm then goes out from the axis of rotation uh, to your person's center of mass. That axis of rotate, or the moment arm points out in that direction Gravity points up, points straight down in that direction. There is some angle between them. They are not parallel or anti-parallel. Clearly, gravity torques the system. If I want to think of a direction, again, cross product. 
my fingers point along the direction of the moment arm and then they curl down to then point in the direction of gravity. Given how I've made this drawing, that suggests that the torque points out of the screen. So the torque of R, uh, R cross F points out of the screen. Yeah, out of page. As a result, there is an angular acceleration that points out of the page. As a result, there is going to eventually be an angular velocity that points out of the page. And if the angular velocity points out of the page, I can curl my fingers in the, in the result to get the resulting rotation. And indeed, it looks like, you know, based on how my fingers are curling, that is the person falling over to the left and rotating to the left until it smacks onto the ground. What was the question? Okay, just describe the resulting fall using torque. So then alpha points out of the page. Eventually omega is out of the page. And by the right hand rule, if omega is out of the page, my thing that corresponds to rotation that looks like that. or they fall over to the left and plop on the ground. Alrighty. Should we do a, uh, here's a, here's a kind of an example. There was no question with this one, but just an example of one of these things. Um, the Lefty O'Doul Bridge uh, in San Francisco is one of these gravitational uh, uh, draw bridges where it has large counterweights uh, that once a brake mechanism is released, that large counterweight torques the bridge and causes the bridge to rotate upward. And then a motor is used to bring it back to its initial position when it wants to lower the drawbridge. But the, it, the way that the drawbridge lifts up is simply because of torque. You can kind of see this big thing out here and there's a big counterweight right here. Kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> we could analyze this, or we could pretend we analyzed this, um, but this is a fun little GIF I found um, that kind of shows there, you can put all this rotation in motion. This is a great example of the whole balls in the box demo, but now with rotation, where rotation is kind of maintained and everyone is kind of synchronized with one another. Um, different people are catching different color balls. You notice if you follow one of them, they sometimes have different colored balls, um, but nonetheless the balls themselves are following nice parabolic trajectories um, that they have kind of aligned and synchronized themselves with uh, rotational motion. Why all their legs are chopped off? Unclear. Or why this whole Russian doll thing? I don't know. But All right. Let me put this up because we will need it um, for some other problems. All right, and let's just see. I'll do as many problems as I can until I get sick. All right, 10.37. 10.37, calculate the rotational inertia of a meter stick with mass 0.56 kilograms about an axis perpendicular to the stick and located at the 20 centimeter mark. Treat the stick as a thin rod. So you have this meter stick, it starts at zero here, it's one meter out here, and it's saying set the axis of rotation to be not in the center or not at the edge, but here at the 20 centimeter mark or the 0.2 meter mark. So that might be something of not rotating the pen in the center, not rotating the pen on the side, but rotating kind of like right here, right? So it rotates a little bit um, lopsided. All right, um, the rotational inertia for a thin rod, we can look up. In this case, the rotational uh, inertia of a thin rod is one half m times the length squared of the rod. But 
but that is the rotational inertia for a rotation axis that goes directly through the center of the rod. That is not what this problem is asking. It is asking for have the rotation axis not be at the center of the rod, but be shifted. You know, if the center of the rod is 0.5 meters, uh, then we need to shift it over by 0.3 meters. We can do that using the parallel axis theorem. So I new equals I old plus the total mass of the rod plus H squared, where H squared remember is the shift um, from one axis to a new parallel axis, hence parallel axis theorem. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking my old coordinate axis and I'm shifting it over by H of 0.3 meters. And rather than redo the integrals and recalculate the moment of inertia by adding up all the masses, I can just use the parallel axis theorem. And so I can compute this as 1 12th, uh, the mass of the rod times 1 meter squared, plus the mass of the rod times 0 0.3 meters squared. In the meter, let's see, I didn't write this down, but it's in your book. The mass, it said, was 0.56 kilograms. It's a meter stick, so L is obviously one meter. You can plug all of this in, and then I get, uh, I get 0 0.097 kilogram meter squared. Or I'll know just for comparison, the original case was 0 0.047 kilogram meter squared. So the rotational inertia increased. And intuitively, remember, rotational inertia is lowest when the mass is concentrated towards the axis. It is easy for me to do this compared to me, for me to do this, because the axis, the, the mass is located farther away from the rotational axis. Ten point fifty. A thirty two Newton torque, Newton meter torque rather, on a wheel causes an angular acceleration of twenty five radians per second squared. What is the wheel's rotational inertia? So I have some wheel that has some rotational inertia. A torque is applied. And it said that the torque has a magnitude of 32 newton meters. Which, by the way, just to make sure it's clear, newton meters, we before, before we called the newton meter the joule. We don't do that here. Even though the units are the same, it's still newton meat. Torque has units of newton's meters. But we don't call it the joule since this has nothing to do with energy. So the torque is 32 newton meters. That results in an angular acceleration of 25 radians per second squared. And it's asking, what is the rotational inertia of this wheel? In that case, it is just Newton's second law for rotation applied. The rotational inertia is just the torque divided by the angular acceleration and being a little sloppy with whether I'm using positive or negatives. Uh, but it doesn't matter because if I use, because um, either they're both positive or they're both negative, so it's going to cancel out anyway. And I get 1.28, um, and that's kilogram meter squared for the wheel. Ten point forty five. So this one there's some arbitrary shape that has two forces being applied to it. So it has some axis of rotation. It's attached by something like a screw or a pivot point. So it's restricted to rotate about this axis. And it says over here is a force that's applied. And then over here is a force that's applied. Unfortunately, I drew these as right angles, but 
but not supposed to be. So there's force one, which is a distance R1 from the rotation axis, and a force R2, a distance R2 from the rotation axis. Let's see, they actually give some numbers. Let me copy those down. Uh, force one is uh, 4.2 newtons. Force two is 4.9 newtons. The moment arm is 1.3 meters for the first one and 2.15 meters for the second one. And the angles are 75 and 60. That's theta one, that's theta two. And what is the net torque about the pivot? So here we do have to be careful with our signs because if you note, if I just looked at F1, I would say, okay, that torque to me suggests that it wants to make the entire thing ro rotate counterclockwise. If I pushed on the left side, which is to the left of the axis of rotation, that pivot. But then F2, I would say if there was just F2 in the problem, that force alone suggests that it wants to make the thing rotate clockwise. So we do have to be careful with the magnitudes of our torques. But we could ask what direction do the torques point in? If I do the torque for F1, can I put my fingers along the direction of the moment arm, curl towards F1, my thumb points out of the page. So torque one I expect to be out of the page. For F2, if I point my fingers along uh, the moment arm, with my thumb still pointing out of the page, you know, as I can't, you know, and the force is right here, I can't rotate my fingers such to point downward. So I have to rotate them around, then I can rotate it down. My thumb points into the page. So I expect torque two to point into the page. So again, we will take the conventions that counterclockwise is negative, which then means that we will take, you know, by convention, uh, we will take torque one, um, which will result in counterclockwise rotation to be positive and torque two to be negative. And all I mean by that is we're gonna calculate the torques using the cross product, then I'm just going to manually put uh, I'm going to make sure the signs out in front are appropriate. The nice thing about this problem is it, t is, is it already kind of draws out for you. Uh, the moment arm as a vector is pointing that direction and the force is pointing this direction. So that angle that they give you is exactly the angle between the two. So then the magnitude of torque one is the magnitude of F, the magnitude of R, times sine of that angle that they gave you, 75 degrees in this case. And then I'm going to manually put a plus sign in front of it uh, to correspond to counterclockwise rotation. For torque two, it's similar because again, if I go up here, um, the moment arm points in this direction, the force points in this direction, the angle they gave us is indeed the angle between the two vectors. Uh, but I'm gonna make sure that there's a minus sign in front of it. Now I can add these torques together without having to worry too much, you know, torques are vectors. So, so usually with vectors, when we added them together, we had to be like, okay, what's the X component? What's the Y component? What's the Z component? I couldn't just add blindly the magnitudes together. But in this case I can because they're both in the same plane. This is essentially a 1D rotational problem. Because torque one is out of the page, torque two is into the page. They both are along the same line so the sums of the torque vectors, I can just do it as the sum of the magnitudes. Let's see, so if I do this, uh, I get that it's 
assuming I didn't make a mistake, 5.27 newtons, that's torque one, minus 9.12 newtons, that's torque two, which results in negative 3.85 newtons as the resulting net torque. The negative sign implies what? Clockwise rotation. Or that T net is pointing um, into the page, sorry. So as a result, the resulting angular acceleration will also point into the page. The entire thing will want to start to rotate clockwise as a result of these two forces. Now physically, we could think, what's going on? Can we imagine this? Because the forces are kind of similar. The angles are kind of similar. But notice the moment arms are quite different. The fact that F sub 2 has a much larger moment arm, almost twice the moment arm. Remember, that essentially then doubles the torque. Again, the reason why this is more effective at getting you to torque an object compared to this. Um, longer moment arms. Hmm. All right, now we get to more involved problems. 10.51, I think. Yes. Let me draw it and then I'll describe the problem. So in the figure of a large pulley with two masses attached by a string, there are two masses uh, that have you know, mass one is 0.46 kilograms, mass two is 0.5 kilograms, and they are attached, they are wrapped around a pulley which is mounted on a horizontal axle with negligible friction. The pulley itself has a radius of five centimeters or 0 0.05 meters. When released from rest, block two falls 75 centimeters in five seconds without the cord slipping on the pulley. What is the magnitude of the acceleration of the blocks? What are the tensions in the ropes? What is the magnitude of the pulley's angular acceleration? And overall, what is the rotational inertia of the pulley? Wait, uh, so lots to do here. But let's just look at this problem and think, what has changed from when we looked at things like this before? Notice the, the tension is no longer uniform in the rope. And this is a result of the fact that before we treated the pulleys always as ideal pulleys that had zero mass. Uh, so when we were doing Newton's second law and thought that forces cause things to accelerate, the only things that had mass and could accelerate were the boxes themselves. Because the pulley was assumed to have no mass, no force was required to make the pulley rotate at all. In the case of a pulley that actually does have some physical shape, has some actual mass and some physical size, the pulley, when the masses start to move, the pulley obviously rotates as well. That rotation can't come for free. Something has to be torquing the pulley to make it rotate. What is torquing the pulley? The tensions. And in order for there to be a net torque, you know, if there was the same amount of torque pulling it counterclockwise as clockwise, the pulley would not move because it would you know, be pulling in both rotational directions by the same amount. In order for the pulley to rotate, to have some net rotation, that means there has to be some net torque, which means as a result, the strings cannot have a, un the string rather, cannot have a uniform tension on both sides. an added complication when we treat the pulley as a, as a real physical object. Um, the no slipping requirement also was mentioned. 
All that means is that, you know, you can imagine if block two was enormous, the pulley wouldn't rotate at all. The box, you know, the, the rope would just slide across the pulley and the pulley wouldn't really be able to respond in time because there'd be so much mass pulling the string across the pulley. So it'd be like as if a rope was sliding off a table or something like that. So by saying there's no slippage, uh, just means that the pulley rotates with the rope. Um, there's no relative motion between the rope and the pulley. Okay. So it says M2 descends 0 0.75 meters in five seconds. Without the cord slipping on the pulley. What is the magnitude, yada, yada. Da, 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 da. So now we have to be, we have to be super careful because we, there's so many opportunities for us to screw up the signs in all of these problems. First, I would think free body diagrams for the masses. So here's mass one, gravity is pulling down on mass one, and then the tension is pulling up on mass one. Mass two, gravity is pulling down on mass two by a different amount, and therefore there is a different tension as a result, uh, a uniform tension through the rope up to when it comes into contact with the pulley. Both of these, I imagine, since we are ignoring the mass of the rope, both of these I expect, you know, all of these forces I've drawn, I expect to be constants. Uh, there's no reason why, since the, mat, the rope itself doesn't have any appreciable mass, the tension, once it's not in contact with anything else except the rope itself, you know, so all these intermediate points uh, on the rope, they, by Newton's third law, will distribute themselves so that the tension is uniform up to when it touches the pulley. So then I would say, if all forces are constant, I would then expect the acceleration to be constant. Therefore, if we know that something like mass two, if we know it descends 0.75 meters in five seconds, it's and this is assuming it started from rest, it's easy enough for me to figure out what that acceleration is because I can say 0 0.075 meters equals, uh, well, let's say negative 0 0.05 meters. Um, we'll take for the boxes up as positive. So it descends uh, 0 0.75 meters. It's you know we can say it started from zero. Um, it started with some with no initial velocity, but then it descended right one half a t squared. Um, there's some acceleration here, which if we solve for that, a for mass two. Um, let's see where did I write this down. Um, I get negative 0.06 meters per second squared for M2. Therefore, I would expect A equals 0 0.06 meters per second for M1. Again, if they weren't accelerating the same amount, then the, the rope would not become taut, or if, if they're both accelerating downward, the rope then snaps. Uh, so I can assume that the accelerations are the same, but in this case, equal and opposite signs. One's going down, one's accelerating up. Are we done? What did it ask for? What is the magnitude of the accelerations of the blocks? Okay, so that is, I guess, one part. And it said two, uh, the tensions in the ropes. Well, that's not too bad because I already took the time to do a free body diagram. So I know for mass two, for example, 
the sum of the forces on mass two equals mass two times its resulting acceleration. Maybe I'll call this a sub two and a sub one, even though they're, same, they're the same but with opposite signs. So then if up is positive, that means T2 minus mg m2g equals m2a2. Or that T2 equals m2g plus a2. Which if I plug in the mass of a2, I plug in 9.8 meters per second squared for g, because my convention is that g is always positive. I had that negative sign for the force due to gravity. A sub 2 is negative 0 0.06. I get 4.67 newtons. Sorry, that's a lie. 4.87 newtons. Can't read my own writing. <laughs> For M sub 1, it's the same sort of thing. I'll let you figure it out. Um, in this case, I get the tension in, in string one is 4.54 newtons. Also positive, because it's also point, pointing up. All right, so that's good. I guess that was part two and part three. What is the magnitude of the pulley's angular acceleration? So now we actually have to start thinking about the pulley itself. So it is rotating, and if the, this box is accelerating downward, then this box is accelerating upward. The rotation ultimately looks something like that, a clockwise rotation. Since there's no slipping, you know, I could look at and ask myself, what is the acceleration of this box? Well, we solve for that, Zero, negative 0 0.06 meters per second squared. What then is the acceleration of this little piece of string? Everything is going together, so it must be 0 0.06 meters per second squared. This one, also 0 0.6 meters per second squared. This one, the same, the same up into and including the piece of string that is right at the edge of the pulley before the rope itself starts to you know wrap around the pulley. So even there the acceleration is negative 0 0.06 meters per second squared. Though we have now relationships that relate the linear variables to the angular variables. If we have a circle and I'm saying that this point is accelerating downward with some acceleration a. And this is some radius r. We know that the angular acceleration times r must equal that tangential acceleration. It's not centripetal, which points towards the center of the circle. This is the tangential part. The part that is tangent to the circle is alpha times the radius. So I know this, I know this. Alpha in this case is 1.2 radians per second squared. And I could even write this as a vector and think if this is clockwise rotation, that looks like it is, you know, again, my thumb has to point into the page in order to get that. I was hesitating that I made a mistake earlier. I did not. Then what is the rotational inertia of the pulley? The pulley is rotating because of torque. The sum of the torques on the pulley must equal the rotational inertia of the pulley times its overall resulting angular acceleration. So I can ask myself, what torques are on the pulley?
in which this case I claim there are two torques on the pulley. There is the rope that is trying to pull it in the clockwise direction, and then there's from mass two, and then there's mass one on the other side, which is pulling it, trying to pull it in the counterclockwise direction. And again, along the rope, the tension is uniform up to where it comes in contact uh, with the pulley, which because of the no slip, we can then think of then the rope then at that point just becomes kind of meshed with the pulley. Uh, so that point of contact, the contact force between the rope and the pulley occurs right at the point where it first comes in contact with the pulley. Uh, so at this location and at this location. So that is a dis they both are a distance r from the axis of rotation that the pulley is rotating about. Therefore, there are two torques acting on the system. And both of them, notice they're both kind of downward into the page. So if I were to do the cross products, I would say for T1, my hand comes out, T, and then I, my fingers go down to T1, and my thumb must point out of the screen. Then for T2, my hand has to go out and then point downward. My thumb then has to point into the screen. So they're, it's again a 1D problem. They're both along the same line, though they're, one's pointing out of the screen, one's pointing into the screen. Therefore the torques, you know, one will be positive, one will be negative. Since we take counterclockwise rotation as the positive, you know, the torque from T1 will be positive, and then the torque from T2 will be negative. So I would say that this is going to be R T1 minus R T2 as a result. The first one is the torque from T1, keeping it positive, saying it's out of the page. The second one, R T2, I'm going to take as negative because uh, it's uh, the torque is pointing into the page. And then that results in the overall um, the overall rotational inertia times the angular acceleration. Which again, note, since the thing, since the wheel is rotating clockwise, you know, if I wanted to write this with a minus, you know, I really should have wrote this with a minus sign. You know, before I said 1.2 radians into the page, but again, by the convention that counterclockwise motion is positive, since 1.2 radians per second squared into the page makes things want to rotate clockwise eventually, uh, we should have written that as a, with a minus sign. So then I know everything except the rotational inertia. This entire blob is negative, which again is why I'm highlighting the fact that alpha is, o that alpha is also negative. You can solve for the rotational inertia. And I get 0 0.01388 kilograms meter squared, assuming I've made no mistakes. I guess these two are connected in a way. So that was an involved problem. Um, in this case, it was a combination of linear Newton's laws and rotational Newton's laws. Um, the masses themselves are not undergoing any sort of rotation. Newton's laws, therefore, always apply. Uh, the, the, we could have also done F equals MA for the, for the wheel itself, but it's easier, if you, <laughs> if you call this easy, uh, that the rotation of the pulley can be better understood using the rotational version of Newton's second law, uh, which relates, causes us to think about torques that are being applied on the system. Uh, this is 10.71-ish. In that I solve a slightly different problem but used it as motivation. Let's do another one with the pulley. So two masses, each being 6.2 kilograms, um, are set up as arranged on a frictionless uh, table. 
the pulley itself has a radius of 0 0.024 meters and has a rotational inertia of 7.4 times 10 to the minus 4 kilogram meter squared. There are two tensions, therefore, in the strings. And the question is that the system is released from rest What is the resulting acceleration that ensues for both the boxes? You could also ask, what are the tensions in the strings? We can figure that out too. So again, the thing I would say first is to start with free body problems um, or free body diagrams for the relevant directions that are gonna matter here. So the box on the table does have gravity, does have a contact force, but since this is a frictionless table, that doesn't matter at all. So for that mass, I would say there's a tension T2 that is pointing to the right. There is a pulley, maybe I'll align them. There is a pulley that has torque. This could be a, um, a free body diagram for rotation. There is a torque that is the result of T2 right here, and then a result of T1, um, a quarter of a circle around. And they are causing the pulley to rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise. And then the hanging mass has a tension pulling up and then it also has mg, the gravitational mass, pulling down on it. And you can see the Newton third law pairs, uh, the tensions and the strings are connected to one another. All right, so what do we do? First, I would write down the easy, or I would, we have to think of what can be the case. Um, the first, that, the first thing we can say that must be true is both boxes have the same acceleration. I'll say the same magnitude of the acceleration. One accelerates horizontally, one accelerates vertically. We can infer that that must be the case because if the table's frictionless and you have this weight hanging off the table, gravity is going to want to pull it down. In order for it to be in balance, um, there's a tension pulling up on it, uh, but in order for it to be in balance, I would expect that something with a pulley in the mass would have to be, there has to be some resistance. So the thing is going to move, but uh, not at, say, 9.8 meters per second squared, for example. So if both boxes have the same A, then that also means the wheel or the pulley rather, obeys a relationship where A equals alpha times the radius of the wheel. You know, I should expect that to be true as well. Like what we saw in the last problem, if there's no slippage along the pulley. So let's see, let's call this mass one and mass two, even though they have the same actual mass, but just so I can identify them. For mass one, some of the forces equals the mass times the acceleration implies that T2 is pulling it to the right and that gives it some mass and some resulting acceleration to the right. And again, let's take right and up as positive. For box two, again, some of the forces equals the mass times the acceleration in the vertical direction I might say T1 minus mg must equal m. Uh, now we have to be careful. So I guess I call that A1, call this A2. Uh, A1 we expect to be positive. A1 we expect to be positive. 
uh, a2 we expect to be negative. Um, so we expect in this case a2 to equal negative a1 in terms of magnitude. All right, so I guess I could drop the subscripts and say the two relations that we have is that T2 equals MA and then T1 minus MG equals negative MA if we treat A itself as just a positive number. I can write that down. A is assumed to be a positive number. Let me do a little whiteboard magic and just take another step and write this as g minus a. Moving the gravitational force to the other side. Okay, but then what about the pulley? The pulley again has two torques on... Uh, that's very unfortunate of what I've just done. I labeled this mass one, but then there's tension two. Merd. Let's re let me redefine these, which then means I have to relabel these. This is for two, and that is for one, and that is two. That is one. And I guess that's true still. All right. Unfortunate. All right. So in this case, there are two forces torquing the pulley, both located a distance r from the axis of rotation that the wheel is rotating about. In this case, the sum of the torques must equal the rotational inertia of the pulley times the angular acceleration of the pulley. And maybe I can dispose with all of these vectors if I can convince myself that everything lies and it's all 1D. So I can think cross product, the tension one, the rope that's downward, my hand goes out, then swings down to uh, tension one, uh, it points into the page. So I would say T1, which is R cross F1, is into the page. T2, unsurprisingly, I'll let you figure it out, is out of the page. So therefore, it's a 1D problem. Everything is either into or out of the page. I don't have to worry about um, vectors in any, in any sense. Uh, so in that case, I would say, again, taking counterclockwise as... Um, as the positive convention, I would write then this as R T2 minus R T1 uh, must equal the rotational inertia times the resulting angular acceleration. The angular acceleration I actually also expect to be negative uh, because we expect the pulley to rotate clockwise, not counterclockwise. So I expect alpha less than zero. Again, you could just assume, you could just pretend like you don't know, and as, and as long as you're consistent with all your signs, um, the math will tell you. So then this is R T2 minus T1 equals I omega, but omega is just, um, a divided by R. And here we do have to be careful. If A is assumed a positive number, then I have to write negative A over R, because I expect alpha to be to be negative. I expect the rotation to occur in the clockwise rotation motion. So since we defined, we made a convention that little a was positive, we write this as negative A over R. And this is good. Maybe, 
because now I can solve for um, the acceleration, which is what we wanted. Unfortunately, it involves these tensions that we don't know. But there is where Newton's laws come into aid here. So then we can plug those into these expressions. And then we have an expression that only involves the linear acceleration A. So then it looks like this is minus R minus R over I of T2. T2 we said was MA. Uh, T1 we said was minus MG minus A. And then it all equals A. Oy. The good news is now that we know R, we know M, we know G, we know I, there's more than that, I don't know how, where the fifth one came from. We know R, we know M, we know G, we know I. We therefore know everything except A, so we can algebraically solve this for A and plug that in. So I don't want to make you watch me do algebra. So I get something that looks like um, something like this. Which then, if I plug in all my numbers, I get it is 5.47 meters per second squared. Not quite G, uh, both because there's the other box and there's uh, that force also has to help get the pulleys, the pulley rotating as well. Then you could go back and get the tensions if you wanted to. I got 33.9 for tension two. Uh, and then, uh, sorry, for tension one. Uh, no, sorry, for tension two. Yeah. And then for tension one, I got 26.8 newtons. It makes sense that tension one should be less because the box is ultimately accelerating downward. So tension one, I want to be, you know, if I want there to be a net acceleration downward, I don't want tension one to balance out gravity. And in this case, for 6.2, 6.2 times 9.8 is, um, I guess neither of these would, it's about 60.8 newtons. Um, I guess it's lower also, right, because there's the, it's also dealing with the fact that there's another mass on the table. All right, let me think a little bit about equilibrium. What does it mean for something to be in equilibrium? So in this case, there's, that means there's no acceleration and there's no angular acceleration either. A case of static equilibrium would also be the case where the velocity and the angular velocity are zero. Static equilibrium, something is not moving and something is remaining not moving. But we can write then down a condition for equilibrium. Equilibrium based entirely off the fact that there can't be a net acceleration, there can't be a net angular acceleration. The sum of the forces, the net force equals the mass times the acceleration. The sum of the torques equals the rotational inertia times the angular acceleration. If that is zero for both the acceleration and the angular acceleration, Equilibrium occurs when the net force is zero and when the net torque is zero. Oh, 
that is worth a highlight. The condition for equilibrium, if you say that something is in equilibrium, that means that whatever the net force acting on the object, that is zero. It also means that it's not starting to rotate in any way. So the net torque, therefore, must also be zero. So we can sometimes use this um, to help us out in understanding the equilibrium of particular systems. Let's see, which of these do I want to do first? I have three left, so we were, it's going to go a little long. I could probably cut one of these out. Uh, can I do that? Um, yes, because you have one more lecture. So I could do more of this on the next homework for in the next lecture than for your you'll have it for your homework. All right, let's do the let's end on a bit with a bang and think more about gravitational torque. So suppose I have a block of wood. Well, let's keep it small. So I have a thin rod of wood. It has a flat base and a flat top. And I state and I and I make it rest on the, a table. Do I expect the object to fall? In which case I would say, I think we would all say, yes, I would expect this to fall. You know, that's the case of say, the rod, I leave it at an angle. Of course, it's going to then just rotate down and fall. You can imagine, and then you could say, but I can imagine making it perfectly, perfectly horizontally straight or vertically straight rather. In which case it might remain perfectly stationary, you know, like balancing an egg or something like that. So what's going on when we talk about these sorts of systems? So in this case, there is a gravitational force, which we can treat as it acting at the center of mass of the rod. So there's a gravitational force pulling down there. It is also in contact with the ground, so there's also a surface force that is pushing up on the uh, slanted wood block. And in this case, it is true that, in this case, the sum of the forces, uh, since the object is not accelerating off the table or into the table, the sum of the forces do equal zero. In this case, n is equal to, in this case, just mg. But we would still agree that acceleration occurs in this, but it's not linear acceleration, but angular acceleration. The thing ultimately ends up plopping over to, uh, the right. This is kind of similar to the bike problem we did at the very beginning. And why is that? In this case, we could learn, we could figure that out by looking at the torques on the problem. If I establish this as my axis of rotation, and that's where I imagine that um, the axis, uh, the object is rotating about, then the sum of the torques the torque from the gravitational force um, is some non-zero value. Why? Because it is some distance away from the moment arm. I'm running out of colors. It is some distance away from the moment arm, and it is not parallel or perpendicular to the moment arm. There is an angle between those two vectors. In this case, right, there is some angle between the moment arm and gravity. So there is a torque from gravity. But there is not a torque from the normal force because it is located exactly at the axis of rotation. The moment arm is zero in that case. So in this case, since the gravitational, tor since the gravitational torque is non-zero, the net torque is non-zero, the thing wants to ultimately rotate clockwise. And again, we could try to argue that by the cross product I point my fingers along the moment arm. I sweep it down to point towards the direction of gravity. My thumb has to point into the screen to do that. So eventually, omega is going to point into the screen. Therefore, 
there is clockwise rotation as a result. So it plops over uh, and falls to the right. You know, versus if I had it perfectly lined straight up. In this case, gravity still operates on the object and I can assume that it operates at the center of mass. There's still a contact force uh, with, with the ground. If I again take the ground as my axis of rotation, in this case, I point up to gravity. So there's a moment arm pointing up to gravity which then points straight downward. The angle between these is 180 degrees. The sine of that angle, therefore, is zero. The torque due to gravity, therefore, is zero. The normal force is, again, located right at the location of the rotation axis. It is also zero. And therefore, the net torque equals zero. So when you have gravity operating on an object, the goal of what you want to do, if you want something to remain balanced, the goal is that you want the torque from gravity uh, to be zero. The way you get that is that you have the gravitational force operating above uh, the extent of the object itself. So let me take this wood block again, but I'll make it big and thick. In this case, the center of mass is somewhere like right here. Uh, to make this even more clear, actually, I'm going to make it even a little thicker. And, that, and there's also a normal force that points up. But in this case, the rotation axis, where if it were going to rotate, I would imagine it would rotate, it's going to rotate you know, over here instead. Um, if we were to try to fall over. Um, really, you could treat this entire, entire base as where the axis of rotation is. So in that case, uh, since the... Uh, right, we can think that the uh, moment arm then points up directly from the base to where gravity is. The angle they make is 180 degrees, and therefore there is no overall torque on the system, or it's able to balance itself out. You know, really, if you want the if you want the gross details, you know, really what's going on is that it's pulling down. You might think that the um, there is you know if this is the axis of rotation, that there is some moment, there is some net torque. Um, But really, it's a little unfair because if with this big bulky object, it can't actually rotate about where I've drawn it there. Because if it did that, uh, part of the uh, block would have to sink into the table. You know, we're assuming it can't sink into the table here, so it would actually be you know more like that. Anyway. Ultimately, you want you want the you know if you if it's just gravity you're worried about, you want the gravitational vector to point. You want it to point down. It's going to always point downward, but you want it to be. Uh, inside the base of the system. Uh, let's see. Did I want to do anything quantitative about this? And, or, or I think I'll save that for the next lecture. Let me just do the demo and we can call it a day. So I have this actual block of wood um, that can be used. Here it is. Uh, where it's kind of flat on both sides. Um, but uh, is when I lay it flat on the table, it is aligned at this weird angle. Let's ignore the holes for right now. So in this case, I would agree that, or we would agree, I think, that the center of mass is, is right about here, so the gravitational force is pulling down right here. The axis of rotation is where my thumb is, so there is a torque as a result, and as a result, the object falls over um, when, it, when I release it. If I wanted to instead keep this stationary, I should, what I should do is I should bring the center of mass of this entire object 
so that the center of mass lies somewhere above the base. Because then wherever the center of mass is, the gravitational force will point downward from the center of mass, but then if it's, if it's uh, above the base, the moment arm will be anti-parallel and uh, there will be no net torque. So here's where the holes come in. So I could take this lovely bottle of wine, which I've clearly drank, as you can see, uh, educated guest wine, of course. And I could place it in the system right here. And then I could ask myself, what happens if I let go? Now, what has changed? What has changed is I've added mass to the system such that the center of mass is now no longer here, but it's brought over closer to where the bottle is because the bottle is quite heavy. So as a result, the center of mass has moved and shifted more towards inside the bottle. And it hasn't, it turns out, there's enough glass back here, it's shifted enough so that the center of mass of this entire thing lies uh, above the base. And so the gravity is pulling down, you know, but the moment arm is pointing up, so there's no resulting torque. What if the bottle is full? In this case, seven moons, also appropriate. In this case, it's the same thing. It's okay as long as the mass that I've added keeps the center of mass somewhere above the base, which it does. I can even add two and consider the center of mass of the entire system. But as long as the center of mass is above the base, there's no resulting net torque on the system and everything remains stationary. All right, that does it. There are a couple more problems on this I want to do on equilibrium, uh, but I'll save those for the next lecture.